Just stop it. The -the run-of-the-mill, cheesy, humdrum bullshit status quo just tires me out. What fascinates me are the industry disruptors, the superhuman frontiersmen or women who go through hell to achieve their goals. Join me as we meet and learn from those mavericks, rebels, and business leaders that aren't afraid to piss off the establishment in order to make radical change for good. Sponsored by Johto PR, the disruptive anti-PR firm that murders your competition with cinder blocks and cyanide. This is Disruption Interruption. Welcome back, everybody, to Disruption Interruption. I'm your host, KJ, and we're here today to talk to another industry leader that has steered off the lame, tired path of the status quo. Today's guest has been disrupting the fitness and wellness industry for two decades. She doesn't look that old. She's been a teacher to a yoga studio manager, a boutique studio consultant to a SaaS expert at a well-known global company, and now a fit tech founder. She's actually one of the only two female executive leaders in fit tech. And we're talking to her today because her company is disrupting the fitness industry, using data and behavioral science to allow gyms to create loyal enthusiasts as clients, something every gym struggles with. Coming to us live from Solana Beach, California, please welcome our disruptor, president and co-founder at Walla, Laura Munkholm. Hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. (laughs) Thanks for having me. I am super thrilled to talk about this because I think fitness is a passion for many people. It's been a passion of mine for, you know, ever since I can remember. Uh, But before we get into that, I want to find out from you you've gone through many different iterations of your career path in the fitness and wellness industry, right? Now you're in fit tech. Right. What has been your main ingredient for disruption? I think my main ingredient for disruption is empathy. Frankly, Um, I've been in the seat of the studio owner, the studio manager, the teacher who is so fiercely passionate about improving the lives, the wellness of people walking through their door every day. I mean, I've been the teacher in the room with somebody walking in who was terrified to step through the door and six months later is less stressed, feeling better, losing weight, whatever the goal may be, and been a big part of the reason for that. That's so, so, it's just an incredible experience. And I've been there with my hands tied by the technology that supported us as businesses and feeling like that took more of my time and energy and drained me. So I was too tired to do the job that I was there to do. Um, So as I stepped into this role of, you know, leading this this technology platform for boutique studios, I, I carry that with me all the time and I make it a point to consistently talk to studio owners so I can remind myself of what I live through and that they're still going through it every day now. Yeah, that is a really, uh, actually it's a kind of an awareness characteristic. I mean, it's your ingredient mm-hmm. for disruption, but it's an awareness character right. of yours, right? This empathy, because not only do you have one side of the coin, super passionate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which is very common in the industry, uh, especially for boutique owners and instructors and, you know, and, um, but then the other side of the coin, which is really unknown to most of the world is the pain and struggle that you have with the technology or the lack of technology. Right. Right. And then the need for it has only grown, especially with the last couple of years. It's not just, you know, I can have my brick and mortar four wall studio and have people walk in and check in for a class. The expectation from consumers is now I can have access to your services anywhere I want, anytime. And studios have to respond to survive. So now it's not just, you know, checking somebody in for a class and making sure their membership charges on the right day. It's also making sure that our Zoom integration is working well and our camera setup is okay and everybody's mic'd up and people from home can log in and have access to the class anytime they want. So there's just another layer now added, and that's it's incredibly stressful for somebody who maybe started out as a Pilates teacher and now is trying to run a business. 
Yeah, that is stressful. And the consumer da- demand is just intolerant. This mm-hmm. instant, you know, gratification, exactly. I can do this now. It's like only made it worse. Um, plus, you know, for the past couple of years, people have been stuck at home. So that's yeah. all, only made it worse too, right? Right. Um, but also, you know, let's go into this thing about the status quo of this particular mm-hmm. industry because gyms, no matter the size, have and I would imagine it's very hard for boutique studios, but they've really struggled with loyal enthusiasts that stay consistently loyal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So they have this burden of lack of technology on top of that. Right. Right. Um, let's you know, let's talk about that because this mm-hmm. is part of the innovation. But Absolutely. you know, what is the status quo in regard yeah. to that? So the status quo, and this number has not moved for decades, um, is that 20% of the population consistently has a a workout practice of some sort, whether it's gym, whether it's boutique fitness classes. um, It's actually been slightly below 20%, around 19. Um, The only thing we've seen make a dramatic impact in that, and this is, you know, talking to um, people at McKinsey, ENY, like hearing kind of bigger picture stats, the only thing that's made an impact in that over the last few decades since gyms and boutique fitness were a thing um, was when super cheap, you know, the Planet Fitnesses of the world, the EOSs came out where anybody could get a membership for, you know, $9.99 a month or, you know, $12.99 a month. There was, there was no longer a cost barrier. And that moved the needle slightly up to, you know, just hovering above 20%. Um, It's really not price that's a factor. So it's really, that's the story. It's really not price that's a factor. And that's why we were so compelled to dig into the deeper reasoning behind it and say, I mean, for me, it's not, it's not that the 80% never steps in the door. Most of the 80% does at some point give some sort of a fitness regimen a try and maybe many times gives it a try, but the, the fear of failure, the feeling like, oh shoot, I didn't make it to class this week. I can't go back. I mean, I'm, I'm already way behind or I got injured and it's going to be so hard to get back to where I was. Like all of those factors play into this kind of psychological game of it's easier for me to stay home and not do anything. And it, there's there's a whole behavioral psychology movement around fitness, wellness, nutrition practices, and how people can ultimately create a habit. And so my business partner, Doug, and I, when we first started talking about doing this, you know, there were so many of the, oh my gosh, like, do we just create a better system than what's out there with a little that looks better and is a little, little easier to use? Well, yeah, we can, but that's not that exciting, you know, like, but what is exciting is, can we move the needle on that 20%, you know, 5%, 10%, maybe more, because we actually tap into what's happening in people's minds when they consider whether or not to walk back in the door of that studio. So we ultimately said, hell yes, like we have to go down that path. Yeah, that's really very interesting because it is a mental game before it's a physical game, right? Yeah, uh-huh. like, of course. Like, um, you know, I was a collegiate athlete and you're trained. Me too. See, there you go. <laughs> There's the passion, right? Yeah. Um, you're trained in the mental aspect probably just as much or more then you're trained in the physical aspect and part of the physical aspect is having the mental fortitude and wherewithal to push through. Right. Right. Um, and it's like, you know, it's like, it's got that team aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's got that responsibility aspect. Many times you have a scholarship, you know, connected to it. So it's like do or die. Um, exactly. I love that you bring that up. Right. Yeah. I love that you bring that up because I take that mental, you know, fortitude and um, the, the thought process and the surroundings, right? Like you said, the team, the coach, 
And I kind of layer that into what we're talking to in boutique fitness. I'm like, okay, who's the coach in the studio? Who's the, who's the team? Who, who's the support system? Like who are the yeah, you have a coaches? whole support system that yes, supports yes. the team, right? Logistics and you know, this and that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. The village for sure. Exactly. And when we started working with, um, so there's a company called skill power that had been kind of dipping their toe in this field, this behavioral psychology field around nutrition, fitness, wellness. And um, they worked with leading researchers from MIT, Stanford, um, Penn State, who were really working on what it takes to build a habit and to really get people consistent, to, to change something in their life and really adopt a growth mindset mm -hmm. in what they're doing. And they were actually working with the military. So the their biggest it. contract was with the military. And Believe it or not, 20% of the military is considered obese from a BMI perspective. And so yeah. that was mind blowing to me. And so that's, that's why they got that contract. And that's why they were moving in the direction to really, mm -hmm. really make an impact on fitness and wellness for them. And we said, okay, so what's the difference? Can we, can we adopt this in a boutique fitness studio when people are walking through the door? And the answer was absolutely, because it's really based on customization, how you communicate and how you motivate the individual. And we all need different types of motivation. We all need different types of communication to make us feel um, disarmed, comfortable, but then confident and motivated on top of that. That's fascinating. I did not know that, what is it? 80% of the military is? No, 20%. 20 okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> so just reversed on the other side. Yeah, exactly, okay, exactly. Um, wow, that's really fascinating. So I, imagine I mean, you can customize it so you've got boutique gyms all over the place different zip codes mm -hmm. different areas right yeah i was thinking you know as you were talking like um you know and i'll date myself in high school i um taught aerobics <laughs> Crazy. oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> did and, you wear the um, outfit please tell yeah. me you wore the outfit like the leggings oh, the i totally wore the outfit in fact i could still rock it today the tights the leotards the leg yes. warmers i was like hot right <laughs> Um, but I taught it for two things, two areas, right? And that was my, that was my after school job. I made a lot of money out of it. I did good. Um, it was this, I don't know, this purple gym and it was all for women. Do you remember that back in the day? It was like a curves, like curves for women. Was it, no, was it curves? Curves might know. be newer than, I don't know. I don't it might be newer. In fact, yeah. we actually, we, we actually did campaigns for curves now that I think. Wow. Um, it was something like that. And it was all women. Mm -hmm. And they were all like middle-aged, you know, housewives. Yeah. They had a totally different reason for being there. Right. I noticed that right off the bat. But I also taught at Gold's Gym back <laughs> in the day when it was. <laughs> oh, yeah. Those those were like the heyday Gold's Gym. Right. Like. <laughs> and um, at those people in my class, right? And the people that went to the gym, like the bodybuild, they had a totally different psychology for, you know, going to the gym. I even saw that back then, right? Yeah, right. So you could actually, so let's get into this innovation, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could take this technology, right? And customize it for different studios, right. different zip codes, and find out what the, what the psychographic data is that makes people go, go to the gym is that right well it's not necessarily what makes them go to the gym it's what makes them come back because oh. what makes them go to the gym is like that's not the problem there are always going to be reasons to step in the door and that that 80 percent that isn't going consistently like i mentioned before they do step in the door um but it's what makes them stick with it. That's the challenge. So the key. yeah, the key here is, so what, what these researchers put together was a personality profile assessment. So it's essentially a personality quiz, um, but it's focused around wellness practices and, and motivation there. So it identifies you as one of four different personality types. So giver, thinker, maverick, or doer. And each one of those. Hey, hold on. Very... Giver, thinker, maverick, or doer. Correct. Yeah. Could you be a combo of them? 
So everybody is a combo in one way or another. Like it's like any personality, any like Myers-Briggs or any of those where you've kind of got like, you know, a couple different layers to who you are, but everybody has a dominant one. And in, in understanding this, it's going to help not only the teacher in the room communicate with people in the class. So givers, for example, they need all of the like high fives. You're doing awesome. Oh my gosh, what an improvement from last week. Thank you so much for showing up. Like those are the people that need that kind of communication. Doers need it to a certain extent, but theirs is more like way to hit that goal. Like they they just want the recognition, right? Like they don't need the, they're going to, they're going to get there. They just want to be recognized when they get there. Givers need all the motivation along the way. Thinkers are the people who are going to be like, why? Like, why are you telling me to do that? So they want, if you're in a yoga class, for example, and they say, you know, draw your shoulder back in space. Why? Like, what does that do? Okay. So that perfectly aligns your spine and you can take a deeper breath. So giving that like extra cue is going to be like, oh, I like that teacher. That teacher really gets me. Um, And then a maverick is the person that's like, don't tell me what to do. If you tell me I'm doing great in class, that's condescending. It's annoying leave me the F alone. So it's, (laughs) it's so helpful to have these little things. And what we do in our, in our platform, if you've ever, anybody who's listening, who's ever been behind the scenes in a fitness studio, you have a screen with everybody's names on it. Um, In our software, you've got their pictures and their milestones. So how many times they've come to class, we're giving you a picture of who the individual is that came into the studio. Mm. But we have a, a little colored ring around their picture with their personality type. And when there's a little hover state, so when you hover over it, we give you like three little tips on how to communicate with that person. So this individual is, you know, a giver. They love external motivation, um, doing things in groups and, you know, all the cheerleading. Um, This person's a maverick, like don't push them. Don't try to tell them what to do. Just show them the path and let them go, you know, like that kind of thing. And so not only does it help in the room, but studios are also sales machines, right? Like they're trying to close deals, get people to buy memberships to consistently show up. So it gives the desk staff, the managers, the sales team information on how to communicate with this person, both when they're talking to them in person and when they leave the studio. Mm -hmm. So in order to get somebody to come back to class, it's going to take some customized communication. And what I see in in the consumer driven industry we live in, um, we're used to now people speaking our language. Like I show up on Google and there are the exact, you know, yoga pants that I just looked at on Athleta five days ago showing up and following me, right? Like everything is so customized to me and what I want. And I can make a purchase on Instagram in less than 30 seconds from the second I see something. And so, like you mentioned before, the instant gratification, but the personalized instant gratification is so expected now. And if we can give studios that tool, now their email, their text message marketing can be customized to that individual's personality. We give them data on their habits at the studio. So what teacher they're going to the most, what type of class, if they've had a drop off in attendance. um, We know that we feed that in a very actionable way to the studio. So now their communication with the, the consumer is just spot on. It's exactly what that person needs to hear. That is really interesting. So it's actually increased the ability to market quality because exactly. I mean, I've, I'm sure you have too. Uh, done a lot of different things, right? Like yeah. yoga, Pilates, like all of it, all of it, right? And I noticed that um, to get me to come back, it was always commoditized, like three exactly. months unlimited, you know, for this amount, or that it was always lowering a price, lowering a price. And that never worked exactly. for me. Right. That's been, that's the status quo is the only way to retain clients is deals. And I was so sick and tired of the race to the bottom in this industry and seeing studios not understand what the financial impact on the business would be. So Part of what was such a challenge is in their existing software platforms, it's very hard to tell how much money you're making each class from each individual. 
Um, and part of that is because they're on all these weird unlimited for two weeks and then unlimited for a month. And then you don't know how many times they're going to come in that period. So, you know, we've had to work through that and we, we've built out, you know, analytics and financial models that understand it now, but the studios didn't actually understand the impact of all of those deals until it was too late. And all of a sudden they're paying their teacher way too much and they're net negative on the classes that they're performing. So it was just this spiral and the cycle and race to the bottom that was ultimately going to kill our industry. So I, that was a, a big driving factor. Obviously I love the idea of consumers being more successful and moving the needle on that 20% and getting more people to come in. But I'm also such a believer in these businesses, especially the boutique fitness industry where there's, there is that accountability, that family, that team around you. You show up to class and you see a lot of the same faces every day. Mm -hmm. And you go through that same hour together with like a beginning, a peak and an end where you've made it through the hard thing together. And it is, I, maybe it's, I hadn't thought of it that way, but maybe it is my athlete background that just loves the sense of community and team there that I just want to see these studios succeed so badly and they needed something else to keep people coming back. The deals are not sustainable. Yeah, no. And you don't really get that in the large big box. No, gym. no I mean, I've been different. members of that too. You just really don't get that. Right. I mean, people are really loners there. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's pretty rare. I mean, every once in a while you see people like a husband and wife come together or, you know, people who have seen each other, 20 times and they work in sets every now and then, but yeah, it's loner. You're, you're there to accomplish your goal by yourself. And, and what's been the status quo? Like, yeah, it was going to be the death of the industry, but there's always a new boutique gym cropping up or mm -hmm. a new fad cropping. I mean, it just seems like this ever site, you know, cycle right. that's going to happen. So if somebody goes out of business, somebody else crops up. Somebody goes out of business, somebody else. Right. Crops up. Right. And there, ha but there have been really stable, like, yoga has been around forever people yoga is one of the more stable ones but it's one of the as i was mentioning one of the verticals within boutique fitness that i mean memberships at some yoga studios i've gotten down to like 65 dollars a month and that is absolutely unsustainable they they are losing money on those people um and so yoga is one that's been around forever it's gonna it's gonna continue to be around as long as they can learn how to run their businesses Pilates, same thing. Pilates is a very consistent, little more personalized, like smaller groups usually in the classes there. Um, and then boot camp, which seemed like it was a fad when it popped up, but like boot camp hit type classes, that has stayed consistent from a growth perspective. That people really, really like that. The thing with boot camp is it's harder to get people in the door because it is hard. Like you know, yeah, you're gonna it's a little work, intimidating for some right, people. Like, right hit classes, you know, you are going to work your butt off and it's going to be hard. So there's just, the, you know, those things. And then cycling, um, cycling is another one that's just been consistently there. It was disrupted more by the Pelotons and, you know, some of these are all being disrupted by the in-home equipment, but what we're seeing is 60% of consumers post COVID want a hybrid approach and they want to be able to pick and choose. Like they want their membership at the studio and they can go to classes when they want, but they also want an on-demand video. So if they, you know, don't have time to commute there that day, they can take a class at home or, you know, it's, it's just become this mindset of convenience and I want what I want when I want it. And we don't want um, much, do we? <laughs> no, we're so easy as human beings, aren't we? <laughs> what kind of success stories have you been able to create with Ooh, Wallet for question. some of these boutique studios. Yeah. So there's a studio called, uh, this is my favorite because it's just emotional for me, um, but Love Yoga. And it's in Oregon. And when she came to us, she was considering going out of business. She was like, you know what? COVID crushed me. I, frankly, I don't know how to come back from this. That's another this is, thing. That's really yeah, hard boutique studios, right? For sure. For yeah. sure. Because it, it there were two factors that allowed studios to succeed, whether their landlords would negotiate with them and they had rent relief or at least, you know, it was able to be pushed out. Um, and whether they were able to adapt quickly to a hybrid model. Um, and a lot of studios gave up quickly because they just said, this is too much for me. I can't figure it out. I don't want to have to, you know, 
figure out all the technology. So a, a lot of the studios, when they come to us, have duct taped together systems. Like I'm using this for this, that for that, you know, that I'm manually entering it all into my CRM and, and you know, it's, it's a mess. She was one of those. So Love Yoga came to us and just said, you know what, this is my last effort. I, I love, she came to us because she heard me on a podcast actually, um, where I was speaking about female business owners in this industry. And she was like, I just, you know, if I'm going to spend my last few months, I want to spend it buying from a woman business owner because that's who I am, which was awesome. Um, and so she started with Walla, I mean, early. She was one of our earlier beta people. And it is awesome to watch her now. She is thriving. She has a community that has come back. She's figured out how not only to talk to her, her clients in a more effective way, but she, she consistently said she was just spending hours and hours of her day trying to figure out how to pull data from her old system or how to communicate with clients, um, dealing with customer service issues because they couldn't book on their app or something was broken. It was just nonstop issues. And she's like, I, Walla gave me my time back in my life so I could dedicate that to my programming. So I could figure out what classes they needed. So I could hire the right teachers and, and gave her the time and space to figure out how to shift her model in the you know pandemic adapted world and make it successful. Wow. So I, I so love good. talking to her and it's like, what a just benefit. Knowing, I know. You just mentioned it, save the time to be able to put the energy on creating yeah. the programs yeah. and the workouts and the, yeah. Yeah. What Which they're is, passionate about. Right. Exactly. I, I just got back from running. We hosted an event in Denver for a bunch of our clients. Denver's turned out to be this fantastic city for us. Um, and one of the clients we had there said with her old platform, she was spending 15 hours a week on customer service issues and on the phone with their customers customer service, trying to fix problems in her software or answer client questions because it was so complicated and just an ancient piece of software. Um, there was nothing modern about the experience for anybody using it. Uh, it was just friction point, friction point, friction point. And she was like, I, I have a four-year-old son. I have 15 hours of my week back right now to, like you said, Aww. work on programming hang out with my son. Like I get to see my kid, yeah. <laughs> which is awesome. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Well, I'm a data nerd. I, are you yeah. able to see like different parts of the country and you know, if there's more thinkers or mavericks or doers in certain areas, or is that just like a very uneducated question? No, no, no. It's a super educated question. And it's actually, so I don't have that data yet. We are like tip of the iceberg on this. So the, the cool thing about what we're collecting right now is all of this aggregate data. So we can start, I mean, spoiler alert to anybody listening who's a Walla customer or going to be, um, what we're working towards is building a retention as a service platform. So we can predict churn in your business. We can predict when someone is going to start tapering off because we can watch their attendance habits. We can watch their spend habits. We know their personality type and what that personality type is likely to do. So our goal is not only to be able to see that big aggregate data nationwide and say, you know, more givers than Mavericks come into fitness studios and stay longer. Um, but we want to be able to take that all the way down to the individual level and say, hey, tap, tap on your shoulder studio. You need to reach out to this person now because you're they're about to go down that slippery slope. Like they were coming five days a week. They were down to four. Now they're down to three. And this week, you know, we, we think they're going to come three or less. So reach out to them, engage with them, remind them how much they like, you know, Carla's classes and bring them back in. So that's, that's the goal. That's where we're moving. And with machine learning and, and AI, we'll be able to do that in a way that's lightning fast and, and that will improve over time. That's so cool. Yeah. I love this. <clears throat> so I usually don't get into the nuts and bolts about, you know, the technology or this or that, but yeah. I'm super curious, how does it work? Like if you were going to, if I'm a boutique studio and I come to you, mm -hmm. like, is it a, is it a, 
um, CRM? Is it a marketing platform? Is it all of the above? Like, yeah. So we're we're a studio management platform that is essentially managing your clients. So CRM type, your staff, every, every studio has teachers. So we've got payroll reporting and things like that and being able to let them clock in and clock out and manage their pay rates. Um, and then also manage your schedule and ways to pay. So one of the, the things about this industry that people don't realize is how incredibly complicated these businesses are. You don't, you walk in and you have a plethora of ways to pay for your class. There's a drop-in, a discounted drop-in, uh, you know, a membership that's eight times a month, a membership that's <laughs> monthly that bills on, you know, X day. Then there's an annual or a 10 class card that you have to use within a certain time. So there are a lot of layers and then people want to pause their memberships for seven days or nine days, you know, like so many layers to how it works. Um, so we handle all of that along with the data. Um, like I mentioned earlier, one of the, the status quo frustrations in the industry was that it was really challenging to get data on your clients' habits and the health of the business. Um, you know, you could get your big picture sales data, but what are the classes that are performing well and why, you know, what are the teachers that are performing well and why, how do my teachers rank against each other from a retention standpoint or a profitability standpoint? Um, I mean, I can tell you it was hell trying to do performance reviews on teachers and old software platforms. Um, so we, we give you all of that data with context and really ways to take action directly from it. So, you mentioned marketing. We have kind of the, the beginnings of our marketing platform um, started in Walla, but that's that's the next step is we're building a, a text and email automation system within our platform. So you can literally look at a dashboard or a report and set an automation from it and say, go, you know, like here are my first visitors. I want them to get this sequence of text messages over the next six weeks. So you'll have um, content built out into that based off the different Psychographic personality profile. types. Exactly. So there'll be four layers of each, you know, here's the intro offer sequence for a giver. Here's the one for a maverick. Yeah, that's yeah. super cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what did you, uh, you were a collegiate athlete. What what sport yeah. did you play or what'd you do? Volleyball. Volleyball. Okay. Good. What about you? Um, I was a professional dance major. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Long story how I got into PR, but there you go mm. on that. Okay, um, yeah. Makes okay, more so sense volleyball. on the aerobics now. You can choreograph a class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, my what, my really good friend, her daughter, um, plays for um, Arizona Volleyball. Oh, dang. Yeah. It's a great program. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, good. And so what are you? Are you a thinker, a doer, a maverick, or a... Wait, hold on. What's the other one? What's the other one? Giver. Giver. Yeah, okay. I'm a doer, okay. which I would imagine you're probably not too. Like a lot of achievers. I, do you know the Enneagram system? Uh, have you ever heard of Enneagram? It's another no. one of the personalities. It's another one of those, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a lot of people who are Enneagram threes are doers because mm. it's it's kind of that achiever mindset. Yeah. Well, I know what I am, disc profile and so forth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I it's it's interesting because I notice now, now that I obviously look at this all the time, um, I don't need the like, come on, you can do it. But I love the like, dude, way to way to get that done. That was right. awesome. You know, the right. high five at the end and like the accomplishment and just the recognition on that is huge for me because it's, yeah. you know, I don't constantly need that external motivation. I'm, I'm driven to do it myself. Right. Um, but I want to be recognized when I when I accomplish. Yeah, something. of course. You get a new PR, you want to be recognized, right? Yes. You wanna, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Doer. So. Okay. Totally makes sense. Do you have another, uh, are you like a doer and a thinker or you would, what are you? I mean, we don't give you the second layer in the test. Yeah, I'm I so know, curious. <laughs> no, I know I have a lot of giver in me too. I mean, I'm a, I, again, like I said in the beginning, my, my kind of, um, secret ingredient is empathy. Like I'm, I'm definitely an empath and, givers tend to put like other people's needs ahead of their own. They're like, they're the people that are going to take care of themselves last. Um, so 
they need somebody around them to like help hold them accountable and be that community. Like, come on, you can do it from, from a motivation perspective, but from like just personality, I, I definitely tend to be in the giver field as well. That's neat. I, yeah. I would imagine people really like taking these personality tests. Everybody yes. Does that. Yeah. yeah. In fact, that was, you know, going out to market with this was a little scary because we, we sold it as like, okay, oh my gosh, we've got this really cool concept. Then we're like, oh God, are people going to take the test? So the the way it works is you sign up for you know your studio class, and after you create your account and buy your package, you get an email um, and a text message or a text message depending on your preferences, um, and says, hey, like let's learn about you. Take this personality quiz. And we were like, fingers crossed, please, people take it. Like, because <laughs> we're relying on the consumer <laughs> to do like something. They like taking it. Do they like taking it? They do. It? They do. Yeah. More than 50% yeah. of people are taking it. So that's huge. That, that really for us was like, okay. I mean, <clears throat> our theory was everybody's favorite topic is themselves. Like, we always want to learn about more about ourselves. <laughs> people take quizzes on, like, what's my stripper name? You know, like. <laughs> So hopefully they'll want to know like what their motivation language is and they do. So that's yeah. Good. Oh, that's great. Was there a particular point uh, along your career that <clears throat> you had this like epiphany or this moment like that's effing it. I've got to do something about this. Um, I've had a couple of those moments, one of which was way before I did something about it. Um, I was actually in the yoga studio. I was I was running a yoga studio, a big one here in San Diego. And I was seven months pregnant, I think. And I, ha- I already had a two-year-old. <clears throat> I was seven months pregnant. I was sitting on my like pregnancy bouncy ball in my office trying to do payroll on a Saturday afternoon where I would have loved to have been with my daughter instead of doing that. And I that week I had had a couple teachers ask me for raises. And I was going crazy trying to figure out like first of all how profitable they were for me already and second of all if they you know deserved it like were they getting their classes subbed all the time were they you know how often were they teaching were they help you know subbing for other people and helping out and stepping up for the studio and I was just so tired and so exhausted with like staring at a computer screen just like tech headache And I just started crying. And I remember like the tears falling down on my giant pregnant belly bouncing on the ball. And I was like, I have to do something about this software. This is the worst. Like no studio owner should have to spend this much time with a basic decision in their business. And I mean, at that time, I had no idea where to start to like find a developer that could help me actually do something about it. Anyway, I you know, that was kind of one of the first moments where I really, really said, I have to, I have to change something. Um, and then later on when my business partner approached me, my now business partner, Doug approached me, I had met him earlier in his last startup. He hired me as an advisor, um, when I was doing consulting and software consulting and and business consulting in the industry. Um, and he and I sat there and had coffee and, just kept talking in circles about how bad the status quo was and how somebody had to do something. And we really believed that we were the, the duo to do it because he had the, the tech background, the operations, you know, scaling a company, selling a couple of companies. Um, and he was like, but I, you know, I need you. I need the person who can be, who understands product market fit, but also can be, you know, the one that can relate to the customer because they don't, they don't need to buy from another, you know, guy like me who understands the technology. Uh, They need to buy from somebody like you who understands them. Yeah. The true empath. Right. Exactly. So those two moments. It really was. Yeah. Kudos to him for, for, uh, you know, yeah. scooping, scooping you up, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's yeah. the future uh, look like for Walla? And, you know, what are the projections? What is the prediction for the industry? Yeah. You know, should this like <clears throat> old data science really start taking root? Right. Um, well, for Walla, we we actually just closed our Series A. So we're in, in a crazy environment. We closed our Series A. So we felt so, so good about the last um you know, six months and we're able to 
um, attract some great attention from some good investors. Well and done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a crazy hard last couple of months. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we got through it and now we are um, ready to grow. So we're, we're in a position now where we're kind of hiring our sales and mar- we've had a, a good sales team, but really establishing the layer for sales in our um, kind of the machine for sales in the business. Um, and then you know we're we're looking at really exploding in the u.s first we we now have close to 100 studios around the country and we're we're really wanting to get that right before we go international but the the plan is to go international as well and then um after that we are you know hoping to make sure you know we're boutique fitness right now and that's kind of our main, main focus. We're one of the few businesses that just focus on boutique fitness. Um, but then we'll, we'll potentially tap into things like kids programming because it's built very much like boutique fitness, um, kids camps, after school programs, things like that, where there are classes kids are signing up for, for like a six week series or things like that. So that's kind of our, our you know, future. That's neat. You'll have to do the yeah. tests on the parents too. Oh God, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> that's because that's actually the buyer. It's motivated the to bring, motivated to bring, bring my the kids, kid, back. right? <laughs> yeah, I like, it. I like it. Yeah, totally. Um, and then the industry. I mean, from what we see, all things are looking good. You know, we're not worried about this industry disappearing. We're not worried about people not stepping back in the door. And if anything, we've brought in the the market for studios because they are now able to attract people who don't want to leave their house. You know, they've got these classes that are focused on, you know, in-studio experience and then classes that are for the people who want to just do it at home. So we see a really positive sign there. That's great. Well, that's a really good time for disruption of SMBs. I mean, I'm seeing that everywhere. So, you know, hats off to you guys for supporting the boutique businesses because it, um, we need a reversal of David and Goliath. We really do. Yes, yes, and that's yes, yes. happening. I love it. I that love it. is happening. Okay, personal questions. Um, what is your crazy passion outside of Walla? Like, do you have any like personal crazy passions? I do. I have two. Okay. <laughs> okay. One is live music. I am a concert junkie. I love, love, love going to live music and COVID killed me that was so oh, yeah. hard to not be able to go to concerts for a couple of years um but i've got some really good shows coming up um leon which are bridges. leon bridges so so excited for him i don't know if you know leon bridges but he's awesome look him up uh, you know i probably um, do but I, 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 yeah. I don't keep those names in my head sometimes yeah. i do right yeah okay good Who, uh, um what else do you have coming up the Head and the Hearts and nice. the Lumineers. Both of them oh. are going to be good ones. I love the Lumineers. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, so those are my next few coming up. I'm very excited about that. Um, awesome. And my other passion is writing. I, I am constantly, like, that's my therapy. I've been writing everything from... I, I mean, I don't technically know how to write poetry, but I think I write poetry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's probably terrible, it. but it's therapy. Um, and then I've been working on both a nonfiction book and a novel for the last couple of years. So that's yeah. neat. Yeah. That's super cool. <laughs> See, I didn't expect that at all. Yeah. Okay. What was your very first concert? Uh, my very first concert was the Lilith Fair. Um, do you remember when the Lilith Fair came out? It was like the Chicks Rule, Sarah McLaughlin, um, Indigo Girls. It was all women. It was all about this, like Lilith, I think, was a, like a biblical character that was kind of a rebel. Yeah. And so they named the whole tour after that. And I, I think I was 12. I don't know. Was, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. awesome. Yes. That's awesome. What was yours? Do you huh? remember? What was yours? Do you remember? Yeah. You know, I was just thinking. Um, I went with my sister. I was 13. She's seven mm-hmm. years older than me. So I went with oh her and her friends and she dragged me. I think it was Alice Cooper. Oh my gosh. As yeah. a first show. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think it was Alice Cooper, if I remember oh, right. That's and, awesome. you know, I had a little boy that I was like dating or what do we call it back then? We <laughs> go with them and he was like super jealous, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so funny. I love it. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Interesting. Yeah. Well, good. So tell me how people get a hold of you. 
So people can get a hold of us at hellowalla.com. Um, if you're interested in doing just like an intro call, learning a little bit about the product, um, or if you want to do a full demo, you can do that there. My personal email, I'm happy to share that with you guys. Send me questions, ping me with, you know, whatever your wonderings are, uh, is Laura, L-A-U-R-A at hellowalla.com. Awesome. Yeah. Laura, thank you so much. I've super enjoyed this. I love hearing about this. As I said, I'm a data nerd. I can't wait to see what you guys do uh, and thank how you, you blow up. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. It's been such a fun conversation. Good. That's a wrap, everyone. If you learned something today or laughed, go tell someone about this podcast and tell people to go disrupt their markets with a tidbit from this show. Thank you for listening to the Disruption and Eruption podcast, where we transform lives, change consumer behavior, alter economics, and never accept the status quo. Ciao for now. Because we live in a highly litigious society, with America being one of the top litigious countries in the world, here's our legal disclaimer. This information is not intended to be a substitute for professional public relations or legal advice. Do not disregard seeking professional legal, healthcare, or financial advice, or delay seeking professional PR or legal advice because of something you have heard here. Contact an attorney to obtain advice on any particular legal situation or problem. Use of this podcast or our website or any of its social media or email links do not create an agency-client relationship between Joto PR and the user.